So this is like the idea of like not being fixed on what you think is good for you because maybe there's something even better that you don't even know about yet. And it's coming, but you don't see it. It comes in such a form that you might not even notice it. So that, that's one of, one of the examples. Alright guys, uh, welcome to the episode 2 and today we want to talk about reincarnation, karma, soul, uh, love attraction, vibration, quite cool topics. Uh, this is uh, Julia Wang from the dreamlifefoundation.com and I'm Mike Sergula from truefury.com. So stay with us and let's start. So what do you think about the law of attraction? Can you explain us a little bit about it? What's your uh, take on it? So for me, the law of attraction is basically kind of, you know, whatever you're vibrating in your energy field, you're attracting that into your life. So. For example, if you're constantly thinking negative thoughts or anything like that, then you're going to continue to attract negative things into your life. It's kind of like Murphy's Law, like, you know, um, the worst things that can happen will continue to happen as long as you're still vibrating on that level. So the Law of Attraction can work against you, but it can also work for you. So you can use it to help you um, attract things that you want into your life, whether it's like a successful business, um, career, or like a healthy relationship, things like that. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, the concept became really popular with a book and movie called The Secret. Mm -hmm. And the, I think there is a lot more to it, the, like the mechanism, the way it works. Uh, from my research and practice and experience, one of the things I noticed is that um, your state, like the emotional state is, is really important. So people talk about, you might visualize what you want, let's say, I don't know, you want a perfect relationship or some physical item, whatever it is, and you keep imagining things in your head. And I think what's even more important than that is actually trying to embody the emotion as it is. Because it seems like uh, the whole attraction per mechanism is related to your emotion more than actually to this idea of seeing and visualizing. So for example, if you are uh, want to create the reality you want to have or create the situation, attract the situation, you actually should think about the state you are in. So let's say, um, I don't know, let's say you want to fall in love and find a partner. I try to imagine the feeling of, you know, being in presence of that person, feeling loved, sharing love. So a lot has to do with the emotional state. And that another thing is when people, uh, for example, want to bring something to their lives, but they are forcing it or they are rushing or some kind, there is like some disturbance in the, the emotional aspect. Mm -hmm. Like they very often might attract a version of what they want to attract, but it is distorted version because their emotional state is also distorted. So, you know, if you think about like, if you're stressed, obviously like the vibration or emotion is going to be irregular, right? It's, if you're relaxed and happy and positive, mm -hmm. it's, it's like very much synchronized, like, you know, right? So, so it's important that emotional state is important. If you really want badly something, and you're forcing it, you actually might attract like a completely distorted version of the thing you want to attract. 
but you are, if you're in a state of like high vibration, relaxed, happy and positive and you know try to embody the right emotions then you should be able to attract what you want yeah so i think there's like three main um, key components to the law of attraction the first being like visualization and f your focus so you know whatever you focus on you attract and then the second thing like you said is you know um when you're visualizing you want to bring in um this like blissful emotional state or whatever kind of emotional state it is that is high vibe so that you can attract what you want and lastly it's um you know you're kind of releasing your focus on the outcome because like you said like when you're you know trying to attract what you're trying to attract and you're trying to force it um you kind of focus on the outcome so you also have to let go of the outcome as well knowing that it's gonna come into your life regardless but not like focusing on like a specific date or time because I think, you know, the universe kind of delivers everything when the universe feels like it's the right time and not when you feel like it is the right time. Yeah, I think um, th there is, that's actually a pretty important point as well. Sometimes um, if you're ever specific, let's say um, you think there is someone like that you know and you feel like you know, this is your perfect partner. But maybe actually, it's not your perfect partner. You would not be compatible and you don't see that. You don't know this person well enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes it's actually, you can attract somebody who is much more compatible with you, even though you don't, might not know this person yet. Mm -hmm. And if you focus specifically on something, it might not be the thing you wanted really. Like you might think you want this thing or this person or whatever, but it's actually it turns out something completely different. Like for example, someone was telling me how like they really wanted to get this job that was paying well and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But once they attracted the job, uh, manifested it, then you know what came with it was 10 times more responsibilities, you know, the guy would just get cold on the weekend at night, had to be putting so much more work into it. Yeah. So it ended up that, that he actually was even less happy mm -hmm. because he was more drained and stressed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the, there's this aspect that you can manifest exactly what you desire, but it might not be the thing that you actually gonna make you happy or it's gonna be benefiting you. Yeah. And or you can be more open to attracting something that um, you know, something that's gonna benefit you and you're gonna be happy with, but you might not even know what it is yet. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. So I think this is like an important aspect of like how you focus on what you want, you know? It's like you should think more of getting something that's going to actually fulfill you and make you happy mm -hmm. and rather than you know something you think it's it's like this particular thing going to make me happy because it might not be the case yeah so with that i think it's um important to look at you know when you are using the law of attraction like what it is that you really want not just a specific goal but like the underlying thing that you really want like you said like you might be you know, asking for like, you know, a new career or a new job that pays more, but like you have to think about what does that, you know, new career provide for you? So is it, is it more money or is it a feeling of fulfillment, yeah, exactly. things like that? And, you know, I think that's where things kind of get um, messed up when you're using the law of attraction. If you're not really looking and evaluating like what it is that you really want, because we all kind of want something that is deeper and more meaningful. But when we kind of set goals, it's always like at a surface level. So we have to dig a little bit deeper into what it is we want so that we can manifest better, I guess. Yeah, I think there are also, um, one thing you mentioned uh, is that, you know, the law of attraction doesn't care what you want, it cares what you focus on, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're worrying about something of you are thinking about what if this go wrong or you know you're actually putting your attention towards a negative outcome mm -hmm. that's what you might bring that's what you might manifest so it's really important to not put so much um, 
effort or attention towards things that you don't want to have because you're actually going to be bringing them anyway and you're going to be focusing on them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I have a couple of examples that I believe that you could see love attraction actually taking place or manifesting. So, um, for example, the story of Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. So Edison was this renowned scientist and inventor. Uh, already Nikola Tesla, when he came to the US, he was much younger. I mean, like, I don't know, a couple of years younger. So mm -hmm. he was still, he wanted to work for Edison as his assistant, one of many assistants that Edison had. Because at that time, for Tesla, Edison was like this god-like figure, you know, it's like this great inventor and I want to work for him. Mm -hmm. So, um, what happened was that Edison was working on a direct current and Tesla had ideas on how to use alternate current, which was like a different system. And Edison was convinced that Tesla's version, alternate current, was not viable because of uh, high voltage, was dangerous, etc. And he was pushing on, like, you know, we're going to work on developing direct current system. When this guy who came to work for him, he was proposing him to switch to something different. And the whole situation turned out that you know, like Edison said something to Tesla, like, if you're going to help me to solve this problem, which was related to fixing something with the direct current system, so the system that Edison was working on, you're going to win $50,000. And Tesla actually did that. He helped him to improve the system. But then Edison said, like, I don't understand the American sense of humor. And I did, uh, Tesla took it personally and left, quit the job. And what happened over the next few years was that Tesla started working on the alternate current, his own ideas and system. And it took over and it became the main system that we use today still. So there was like a compet you know, they were competing between themselves. But ultimately, Tesla won with the system that he, he was right about it, you know, it was a better system that we could use. So the way the law of attraction works here, this is like the way I analyze it, is that we have someone like Edison, who thinks that he wants to work on this particular thing. He thinks, you know, I want to bring electricity to the world, and I'm convinced that direct current is going to be the one that's going to succeed. But there is a better version, but because he's stubborn and focused on, he doesn't see the other options, mm -hmm. he actually attracts someone who can convince him and help him to develop what he wants to do, which is going to be the main system. But, you know, he's arrogant, he's stubborn, so he doesn't see that, and that opportunity passes, you know? The guy who brought him idea that he could help him to do it, he would be his assistant only and he would be the one bringing it to the world. He didn't see that and he also was cocky and arrogant. So through that, he lost the opportunity and, and then the system, you know, appeared anyway. So this is like the idea of like not being fixed on what you think is good for you because maybe there's something even better that you don't even know about yet. And it's coming, but you don't see it. It mm -hmm. comes in such a form that you might not even notice that. So that, that's one, one of the examples. Do um, you have any like examples from your own life, maybe? Um, I mean, there, I think there's been a couple of times where the law of attraction has worked for me, and it's, you know, when you really focus on it and do it every single day, I think that's really important. Um, for me, it could be something like attracting new clients. Like when I first moved to Barcelona, I remember like writing down on a paper my goals um, of attracting new clients. And actually, like the next day, I 
like got two new clients like immediately and it was like effortless you know it's like I kind of just thought about it set the goal wrote it down and then it kind of just like magically appeared so it can definitely work in that sense um, but I think sometimes it doesn't always work exactly like the way you plan it to like you said so it can like come in many different ways right um, yeah. yeah I mean I think um, it's a little bit like the more you practice, the more you put effort, the more you think about it, visualize or keep it in the back of your head, the more likely you are to manifest it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a whole aspect of, um, like for example, let's say you want to be, um, I don't know, let's say some kind of NBA basketball player, but yeah. you're like an average amateur, for example. <laughs> you uh, just suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you have a goal that is very far ahead and you're not there yet, right? Yeah. You can just, you know, spend like 24 hours a day visualizing yourself, you know, wearing NBA clothes and being the best player. Mm -hmm. You got it resonate with the goal yeah. and so the law of attraction puts you by attracting people events information whatever it is to your life that helps you slowly to, and puts you on the path towards the goal so you by doing these things and you know training and getting maybe the right uh i don't know the right trainer you know the right information you improve, you put effort, all these different things. It slowly uh, you start vibrating to match the goal you want to have. So it can be, you know, you might be visualizing it, you might be focusing on it, but you also need to be doing the work, obviously. Like it's not just yeah. going to happen <laughs> overnight. You, mm -hmm. you got to start putting effort. Yeah, so I think like taking action is obviously an important key. Like you said, you can't just, you know, only visualize and expect you know everything that you want to magically appear um, but I think the power of this visualization in itself is like really powerful like they have research articles that um, test people uh, like who have kind of like muscle disorders where they're having the person visualize every single day that they're using the muscle and over time they actually like see an increase in muscle strength so it does work to some degree when you're only visualizing but of course you have to also take action you know you can't just sit there and um, expect things to like magically appear for you yeah I think uh, um, a really good example of someone who I think is a really good manifest Manifestator. <laughs> Manifestor. Manifestor. Uh, it's Conor McGregor, who is the superstar MMA uh, mixed martial artist. And he's been talking about actually that he's using law of attraction, he's visualizing things, he is, he, he read the secret and all this kind of stuff. Already? Already? The, you're the featherweight champion yeah, already? Of course, I see myself from, as the champ from day one. Before I even started training, I always saw myself as the champ. That's now, how I see myself. I visualize myself already there. I visualize everything. I visualize this conversation. I visualize the walkout. I visualize everything going on. I know, I know I have shots picked out that I'm going to throw in this fight in five weeks. You know what I mean? I, I have seen everything in my head, and now it's going to happen. You see it in your head, you're going to see it before your eyes. That's what uh, I say. We talk about the emotional state being a key part. Yeah. You know, if you have someone who is like an excellent athlete with you know he has a lot of energy obviously in cardio and everything mm -hmm. and then his pride which makes him happy about himself because there's a lot of ego involved in it. when you win fights and when you become the champion you know you have a lot of ego you have a lot of pride which is also about like you know you feel good about yourself you have this emotional state that is very very high Mm -hmm. like much higher than most you know, other people right yeah and when you add that aspect of having a lot of energy that makes him like this super conductor like this this uh, magnet for attraction yeah 
that combination of these other aspects. So you can see when you add like the aspect of visualization and manifesting manifest things like he does, like he does whatever he wants. So for example, he's like, you know, he predicted how he's gonna win his world championship. He mentioned like, this is how I'm gonna win the first round, something like that, and he did that. Or he wanted to fight uh, with Mayweather, you know, for the boxing match worth like hundreds of millions of dollars or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that never happened with an MMA fighter before. But he also manifested that. He started talking about it and then suddenly, you know, everyone felt like, let's do it, let's do it, you know? Yeah. So he's manifesting things the way he wants, more or less, obviously, mm -hmm. if he's like in that state. So I think, you know, there's definitely this aspect of like your own state, like levels of energy you have and then how much effort do you put as well. Yeah. Cool. Alright, so let's Next topic. <laughs> let's talk about uh, reincarnation in uh, soul and all this kind of stuff. Okay. You wanna start? Um so for me I learned about Reincarnation, uh, when I was a child, I used to go to like a Buddhist temple and that's basically where we learned about it. And the concept of reincarnation is basically that after you pass away, your soul still reincarnates um, into another body so that you can continue living and experiencing. And there's this whole concept of um, karma that's related to what you reincarnate into as well. So. Your soul is, you know, always present, um, but it continues to reincarnate until you finish, like, your mission on Earth or whatever. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there is also a lot of people have, like, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, when they kind of separate from their bodies and they see um, reality differently as a spirit or as an astral projection as a body. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a good um, example of the confirming that you actually are not a body. And also, um, you know, we talked earlier about um, collective consciousness as God, you know, the God is just supreme intelligence, everything is God. Mm -hmm. The universe is just the creation of the collective mind. Yeah. I think this is a kind of like fits this whole thing fits together. So, for example, if like everything is just this supreme intelligence, but it's kind of um, splitting itself into smaller units of consciousness to experience itself and to create reality and all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. like like reality that we experience is just. A temporary thing, but the consciousness, the mind, or the soul that part of the collective consciousness is actually still there. Yeah, it just wants to experience, and it's just it's something that probably continues forever, but it can, uh, you know, get inside reality, same way like you have a dream, you know, you, you just experience a particular even your dream or life and then you go out and you get in again and so you constantly continue and um, there is a lot of actually a really interesting pieces of evidence supporting reincarnation because mm -hmm. obviously you know it's not something that is uh, taken seriously in the scientific community but uh, people like Dolores Cannon for example she was uh, this uh, hypnotherapist and regression therapist who um, was working with thousands of people and putting them into this hypnotic state where they would uh, go to their childhood in a trance-like state and then they would actually go beyond this lifetime earlier in previous lifetimes and she worked with thousands of people and she started noticing how these different lifetimes 
that they experienced, they could see, they could tap into, were actually connected with what they were doing in this life, or they were somehow linked or impacting them, or there was some kind of outcomes. Yeah. And uh, so she apparently even like could see through many, many people what happens with them after they pass away, like there, a lot of people were repeating the same things, you know, they could see the same situations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this is a, another, you know, really good uh, example that gives you some idea that maybe like the concept of recognition is, is actually a real thing. Yeah, um, in my work as a hypnotherapist as well, I remember doing like a couple of regressions where we actually went into the client's past lives and um, what we realized is that, you know, you can actually carry on like beliefs or promises you made from like a past life into this current life. So one of my clients basically um, regressed back to a scene where she saw her on her deathbed and she realized that in that lifetime she was really selfish. And so um, she made that promise as she was passing away that like in this next lifetime she's always going to put other people first. So in her current lifetime, this is like one of the issues that she has, you know, she is always putting other people in front of her and um, like basically neglecting herself. And it was really hard for her to let go of this part of herself because it's something that's so deeply ingrained from a previous life. But for like reincarnation, um, how does it work exactly like because when we come on to Earth after we've reincarnated, we don't like remember anything, right? Yeah. And you can kind of talk a little bit about like karma and how that plays into reincarnation. Yeah, I mean, so um, there is like this whole idea of like if there is this collective consciousness, collective mind, which is like God, supreme intelligence, whatever. Um, what's the point? if you want to experience and like you want to see reality from different perspectives um, you know it's it wouldn't make sense to remember everything because then it wouldn't be fun you would not be able to play with your life with your creativity with things you can create manifest all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so apparently this is why um you know like you kind of have a blank it's like you Born, you are born and you don't remember anything, so you have free will and now you can make choices, you know? Yeah. But you, you kind of like it based on your own free will. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is obviously another thing which is uh, karma. Karma, um, it's uh, this idea that you Let's say if you do good things, good things come back to you, you do bad, bad things come back to you and all this kind of stuff. And you can actually continue repaying things uh, throughout lifetimes as well. So sometimes you might be actually repaying something from your previous lives because mm -hmm. like we look at things like something starts and this is your new life, let's say, and people are going to say, oh, you know, we have like a child. I don't know, maybe dying somewhere in war and how this person or this child deserved what happened to them. But yeah. if you understand more about like life is just a continuation, it's not really like you know one thing. You might be actually repaying situ you know things from previous lifetimes, for example. Or uh, another thing with like these kind of scenarios when you have some traumatic experience or some really bad experience happening um, which you like you might not deserve it let's say you, know, you didn't do anything wrong but something happened to you like one another thing that apparently the way it works is that sometimes you know when you incarnate you actually want to have um, you know, you set up some kind of a soul plan, which is like, what do you want to be doing? Like, you know, who you want to become, what kind of people you're going to meet, maybe some people you know from your past lives. Yeah. So you have a kind of a plan, right? 
and you might have to, uh, you know, sometimes, like, like this is an example we talked about one time, like I was reading about this woman who was walking uh, in London and uh, some guy on a motorbike, he was like cut calling her and, you know, she ignored him and he just decided to drive through her and she ended up in the hospital. And it was a, like a really traumatic experience for her, but this experience made her realize what it is like to be in this situation. Mm -hmm. So she experienced the situation and that completely turned her into a different direction. Yeah. So she decided that she will be, um, you know, helping victims, the women who go through similar situations. Yeah. So maybe that was like this whole soul plan and whole that's what she came to do, like the, what she wanted to do. Yeah. But in order to really start that, she had to go through the experience uh, to like put her on the on the path, you know. First she has to experience how it is, so she can mm -hmm. feel, she understands what it is like, so she can now help others. Yeah. So this is an example where it's not necessarily a karma, like something bad happens to you. Mm -hmm. But it's more like your own previous chunks. And there's a bunch of other things that, you know, there's this concept that, you know, whatever you do, like you have to repay it. There's always a balancing aspect. It doesn't have to be the same thing, but it has to be similar value. Yeah. You know? And sometimes, um, you know, if you want to be progressing with your evolution of your soul, which means like um, you want to be incarnating in better bodies, have I don't know, better conditions, all these kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be repaying things that are holding you. You know, like things maybe you've done that were harmful or hateful, whatever. Yeah. So sometimes people might decide to incarnate. I I was reading about these cases uh, where someone would decide to be born blind completely because that would allow them to not be judgmental completely. So that aspect of repaying a judgment, you know, would be completely cleared in mm -hmm. one lifetime. So it's like something that could take you many lifetimes to clear. Um, you could do it faster by just, you know, bringing something. So there's a whole new way of looking at accidents, illnesses, and all sorts of things. But it's like, gets in much deeper. Yeah. I mean, so with karma and how it works, like, I understand most of it, but I think it can get confusing because it's like the karma that you're creating now, you might be paying back in the next lifetime, or does it work like automatically? Is it something yeah. that, you know, you do a good deed and then you get repaid immediately, or does it also affect like your next life? I mean, it could be both, I mean, right? The thing is, like, the idea is that the continuation of lifetimes, you know, we look at it, uh, one lifetime is a big deal. Yeah. Right? on the big scale, it's like a dream, you know, every, every night you go have a dream, you know, you go to sleep, mm -hmm. you wake up, you, it's the next day. So on the bigger scale, this is just like going in, out, in, out, in, out, you know, new body, new life, out. So, that, so it might be that these things are stretching, you know, sometimes they might be happening instantly, over a few years, over a few weeks, um, and sometimes uh, you know, sometimes over a long period of time. And then there is also this aspect of actually um, people saying like, why, you know, you get the same back, like what's the point? Mm -hmm. um, why would I be like doing something to get exactly the same in return? Like, it doesn't make much sense, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the idea is like, let's say if you help someone in need, like for example, I don't know, there's a homeless person and you buy them a meal or food so, and they're hungry. So, so there's like a, you know, someone is hungry and you help them. And then when you are in a similar situation, you know, maybe it's like things go out of control, you suddenly don't have any money, 
Yeah. Like this situation can suddenly appear in a completely different form. Maybe like someone gives you a voucher, whatever. You know? Yeah. So it's actually it's very useful because you know you get it when you need it. Mm -hmm. You know. So, and um, it can I think karma can also keep adding up. So the more you know you keep helping, the more you keep helping, the more you do. It. It's almost like building this momentum of energy that then can turn the situation for you as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So what do you think happens when karma is finally balanced and <laughs> you completed it all? What happens then? Do you just merge back into consciousness or...? Yeah, I mean this is the idea is apparently that we can evolve into um, higher planes of existence, which would mean like, you know, at some point you don't need bodies anymore, you're more like just uh, consciousness or like an energetic um, version of your body and then the, the clearer, the, the less of like uh, things to repay, to pay back you have. Mm -hmm. The more you get into levels that are higher and higher, in, in, uh, until finally you get to the level where you get merged back with, with the whole of everything, right? Like mm -hmm. with, with the God, whatever, collective consciousness. And then you can start again if you want to. <laughs> start again the whole cycle. Cool. Um, so there's also this concept of soul groups when you reincarnate as well. Yeah, I mean, so the, the idea is that we often incarnate with other people, other souls that we've been incarnating through previous lifetimes. Sometimes they are our friends, our family members. We change roles, so maybe one time, you know, it's going to be my sister, the other time we're going to be a couple this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and we they we all decide to incarnate together to help each other, assist each other in some particular ways. I might help you with this, you might help me with that. Yeah. You know, and uh, there is an interesting example of that with David Wilcock. Um, a lot of people might know him. He's like this researcher in, in topics um, that we talk about, mm -hmm. meta metaphysical subjects. And uh, he believes that he's the reincarnation of Edgar Casey. And Edgar Casey was this famous uh, medium living in the US uh, in the past. And yeah, so David Wilcock uh, shows like compares pictures from his life, his friends, his family, and um, they look the same with like, people around Casey. Mm -hmm. They also had a similar stories like. You know, Wilcock was a medium in his early age, you now he's focusing on other things. And uh, even like their birth charts, astrological birth charts, have a lot of similarities. Like some people believe that this is definitely the case. Thanks for checking out True Spirituality Episode 2. In Episode 3, we will discuss higher self, spirit guides, symbolism, synchronicities, and intuition. Stay tuned.